And we're back. Still no theme song, because I should come up with one, shouldn't I? But I won't, because, nah. <laughs> this is Velvet Owl Watches Movies, so you don't have to. With the uh, well-popular response, um, does that even make sense? <laughs> with the great response to last week's educational shorts, I've decided I'm going to do another week of them. Okay, honestly, I'm taping these ahead of time, so I have no idea if people enjoyed the first one, because as of this recording, it hasn't been up, and so no one's heard them yet. But you know what? I enjoyed doing them, because it's a lot easier to watch a bunch of 10-minute videos than one, like, hour-and-a-half terrible movie. So I might make a whole series on this, because there is a lot of just interesting-looking educational films on here and it's always interesting to see especially like the ones from the 50s what people thought and what kind of great minds were at work so we're starting off this week with the bright young newcomer and yes i'm still doing them in alphabetical order and we're only in the b's so yeah this might be like a 10-part series <laughs> but i don't care if you like it or not i like it and you know no one's listening so I should just amuse myself with this, right? Anyhow, the bright young newcomer. Uh, description is how a laser fair lies fair. You know, that French word for hands off. Office manager, in uh, parentheses, male, stands aside as women workers compete with one another. So, um, yeah, I mean, when a cat fight's about to happen. There's nothing for a guy to do but just step back and tape it and then post it to the internet and get lots of clicks. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't think this is going to go into a drag-on, full-on cat fight, but we're going to have the very sexist 50s attitude towards how women treat each other and are forced to compete with each other. And it'll be interesting to see if this, is, this views it as a good thing or a bad thing. So this is part of a series on office manager problems. So, yeah, at least it's going to view arguing among women as a bad thing. Of course, um, it kind of presents it as it's going to be like kind of a natural thing because the narrator, who may or may not be the office manager, I'm not sure yet, says he feels sorry for anyone who has to manage an office that has several women working because problems can arise from nothing. Um... Yeah, so, I'm just, this 50, so there probably won't be like, because she's on the rag. But, you know, they're thinking that. They're thinking that the problems arise because these women are on their rags and they're catty bitches. And, yeah, but they probably won't say it in such words. Okay, the narrator's not uh, the office manager. Office manager is George, and he's got eight or nine women working for him. Because I guess apparently the narrator didn't do enough research before starting this film. Which, I mean, I guess I shouldn't judge him harshly because I don't do any research on the films I'm watching. So, but he doesn't know how many women are actually in the office. And George's star worker or something, or at least the one they're going to put focus on, is Betty. Which the narrator tells us she's short on personality. Which I think is code for she doesn't put out. Um... Yeah, that's kind of just a what? She's just bland, but she's good at her job. She just has no personality. She's so boring. Yeah, but George is hiring a new woman, Joan. And I think you see where this is going, right? Betty's going to be jealous, and she's going to claw Joan's eyes out, cat fight all the way. Wow. Okay, maybe not an all out cat fight, but problems are going to arise. Now, we cut to a couple weeks later because, you know, these things take time to develop. They don't straight away go straight into these problems. So you know how women are. They let things simmer. They, they just get angry out of nowhere weeks later over some sort of, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming that's how these women uh, written by sexist men for this film work. But... Joan, she has some new ideas. She's kind of just 
going to try to upend things because she has ideas on how to make the filing system more effective because right now they're only in alphabetical order. And at first I was like thinking, wait, alphabetical order is making it too hard. What the fuck? It's easy. Just go in alphabetical order. But her idea is to separate all the files by city and then alphabetical order in each city. And yeah, I mean, like that does actually make sense. Like, okay, you could go straight to the city and then there's less names you have to go through to find the file. And, you know, but Betty, she doesn't like this because Joan, you know, she's younger and prettier. So can't have her trying to make waves here. You know, the system has worked for so long. It works for Betty. Why does Joan have to be so different and difficult? Betty goes to George, the office manager. Um, obviously, because he's the only guy in this film aside from the narrator. But she... She goes to complain about George. She's not complaining about George. She's complaining about Joan because she's trying to upend things. And Joan doesn't like the system that Betty came up with. And I got to say, you know what? Fuck you, Betty, for taking credit for this. Your whole system is you file things alphabetically. That's not a system someone develops. That's like just common thinking. Like, how do we organize these files alphabetically? Okay, that's not a system. That's just how the way people do things. I mean, I guess technically it's a system because the other form of system, like the only like less thought put into a system is, hey, I just throw them anywhere. So you've got like the bare minimum requirement of a system and you're taking credit for it and you're all upset like, oh, Joan doesn't like that. I like to do things alphabetically. And... George, you know, he's trying to keep Betty calm. So he says, like, okay, I'll talk to Joan about things. And But as the narrator tells us, George is a busy, busy man and just never gets around to talking to Joan. And he hopes, like, ah, yeah, it'll blow over because George knows nothing about women. Women don't let things blow over. They let it simmer and then kaboom, cat fight. Wow. So, of course... Days later, or weeks later, or months later, I forget how much the narrator said. Betty's looking for a file, and she can't fi find it. <clears throat> and it was a file that Joan had gotten. So where did Joan put it? And Joan's like, oh, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, that's right. Me and the other girls just came up with a whole new system, and that's the way we filed it. And you know what? I have to take Betty's side here, though. Because... That's some bullshit. You completely changed the way you file things and didn't tell Betty? Well, of course Betty's going to be sh pissing, pissed off. She's going to be pissing and pissed off. Um, she's going to be just completely pissed off because she can't find the fucking file because you fucking changed things and didn't tell her. You know, so Betty is 100% in the right here because that's the way things work at a job. Like... There's a hierarchy. You can't go and do things and not tell the boss that, okay, there's a new way that we've, we're doing these things. Because then the boss doesn't know, and then the boss is just pissing. <laughs> so, of course, she goes to yell at George, be like, she's changing everything again. And what did she say when you talked to her? And, oops, I forgot to talk to her about it. Why are you resisting new ideas? And so we're going to learn, because as the title screen tells us, why did, did being underlined, Betty resist the new ideas? My guess, because she came up with the old ideas, and reason number two, Joan is younger and prettier. Wait, what? That's the end? What the fuck? Is there a part two? I, why did Betty resist the ideas? I mean, is this like... It's just left to me, the viewer, to figure out why? And we didn't even get, like, a cat fight? Wow. Just... I, I don't know. What's the lesson I'm supposed to learn? Tell me why. Oh, my God. I, I was so invested in this. And... 
Now, now I don't know how I'm supposed to handle when women in the office are fighting and how to let Betty stop resisting new ideas. Because I can't get her to stop resisting new ideas if I don't know why she's resisting them. You, you failed, video. You failed me. Next up, we've got Care of the Hair and Nails. A fairy tale character uses magic to help youngsters learn good health habits. Which, this is good. I need to learn good health habits. I need to take care of my hair and my nails. Because I don't cut my hair and I bite my nails. And I'm guessing that those are two bad things to do. So, but also I'm kind of worried though. Because the fairy tale character is using magic. I don't have magic. So I can't use magic to have good health habits for my hair and nails. So hopefully the fairy tale character teaches us how to do it without magic or teaches us how to do the magic. Are these all magic tricks? I hope they're magic tricks. So they don't tell us who the fairy tale character is. She's just an old lady. Maybe she's Mother Goose or something. Um, and she stays invisible most of the time, apparently, so that she can help kids learn how to use good at grooming habits because it's best for them to not know she's there. So how exactly do they learn? They think they're just picking this up by themselves. Um, in fact, I'm kind of worried that, you know, is old lady grooming care lady, is she around right now? She's invisible. I don't know when she's going to be around me. Is she in the bathroom with me when I poop? She very well could be. I am scared. I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep tonight knowing that old lady groomer. Is that a good name for her? Because old lady groomer sounds like someone that grooms old ladies. Old lady good habits. <laughs> Just the old lady. I'm scared that she's going to be watching over me while I poop or while I masturbate. Um, maybe she can teach me good grooming habits for when I masturbate. So the first kid is Stanley, who has some fairly decent grooming habits. He washes his face twice a day, which is good. And he washes his hands. But apparently, while he washes his hands, he doesn't brush his nails. And remember, we've got to learn grooming of the nails. So her magic, which is just pausing and rewinding it and telling him, even though she doesn't actually tell him, I guess just in his mind tells him, scrub your nails. And so he scrubs his nail and does a very good job. So A-okay. Um, but did she really teach him? But she says that after that, he never got scolded for not brushing his nails anymore. So, again, was it her that taught him? Or was it just him getting yelled at and deciding, fuck this, I don't want to get yelled at anymore, I'll fucking brush my nails. Jeez, get off my nuts, Mom. So, you know, which one was it? And then she's also going to teach him how to wash his hair. Which, does that mean her his mom was just kind of neglectful? And not washed his hair when he was younger. Because isn't that the way we all learn to wash our hair? Is just from as we're young and we're still getting baths from our parents. They wash our hair for us. And we just through repetition of seeing this. We realize, oh, you put the shampoo on. You scrub your head. You rinse it off. And, you know, hell, shampoo bottles even just tell you the fucking instructions. Lather, rinse, repeat. And I say fuck the repeat. I I do not fall for that. That is just the shampoo industry trying to get you to buy more shampoo by using twice as much shampoo every time you wash your hair. So fuck that. Fuck repeat. But then again, you know, maybe back then, shampoo bottles didn't tell us to lather, rinse, or repeat. So... Fairy godmother here teaches him how to wash his hair. And also very important to, before you wash your hair, wash out your hairbrush. Um, which I guess is a good 
interesting. Though Stanley doesn't really have a lot of hair, so why the fuck does he have a hairbrush? I don't know. I Again, this fucking fairy godmother never taught me how to take care of my hair. Because I don't comb or brush my hair. So come on, old lady. Just do your magic. And then she makes Stanley wash his hair a second time. So yeah, she's fucking propagating the myth of repeat. Just. And again, she's not watching over me because I don't repeat. Why do you not care about me, magic lady? Why do you not want me to be well-groomed? Now, to help learn us of why we need to wash out our brush, she uses her magic eyes. Yeah, not kidding. She says it's her magic eyes to get us to look closely to the skin and see that hair growing out of the follicles. They grow longer and longer, and then a new hair starts growing underneath it, pushing it out. And then when you brush it, when it's far enough out, it takes that hair. Which is actually interesting. I never knew that. I never knew that new hair just grew underneath the old hair. I I always just... I don't know what I assumed. I guess I thought, like, the old hair had to come out and then a new one starts growing. Which I guess doesn't really make all that much sense either. So, I've learned something. I've learned that new hair pushes out old hair. And that fucking magic lady doesn't care about me and doesn't help me groom myself. And we also have to keep an eye to make sure we're not getting any diseases because our hair can get sick. And some of the diseases we can get are ringworm or head lice or dandruff. Which, I don't know, I guess I never viewed dandruff as being like a disease isn't dandruff just kind of flakes of something just building up and you just have to kind of wash it out? I don't know. I mean, Head & Shoulders commercials never, like, treated dandruff as something that's, like, super important. Like, you know, like, oh, you're going to get sick and die from this. It was always kind of more like, yeah, you're just going to look like a douche if you don't. To wash that dandruff off. And everyone's going to be like, Ew, you have dandruff. But for the most part, they always made it seem like it's just a cosmetic problem. But apparently it's a disease. So kids out there, wash your hair or else you will die of dandruff. Then we meet Alice, a naughty little girl who's trying to go to bed without brushing her hair. Um, The old lady doesn't call her naughty because the old lady's nice. Me, I am not so nice, so, but you should c brush your hair before you go to bed at least a hundred strokes, she tells us, which, you know, I mean, seems kind of a lot, but, you know, then I was thinking, well, when you jerk off, how many strokes do you give it? And that'd be an interesting thing, like, count how many strokes it takes you to get off. Me, probably like three. Just, I'm more than a two pump chump. <laughs> Takes three strokes to get me off. Oh yeah, I'm a stud. Which is um, kind of disturbing that I'm going into this and uh, <laughs> talking about a video about kids' grooming habits. But you know what you're in for when you've listened to one of these podcast episodes. And. Alice also takes care of her nails and cuticles and orange sticks and cutting hangnails and all other sorts of things that I don't do and I'm never going to do. And, you know, Lady tells us that, you know, these are just two kids and there's lots of kids out there that need her help and she's going to be there. So why do they themselves have to then learn how to do it if you're going to do it for them? In fact, why do I have to watch a video to learn how to do it when you should be fucking helping me? You know, did you just get tired of, like, going individually to every kid so you just made this video? Like, here, kids, do it yourselves. Fuck you, old lady. Now on to The Children Must Learn, a 1940 film 
about educating the children of Appalachia. So we're going to learn how are they going to teach the kids, the hill, hillbilly kids in the mountains. Um, I'm guessing, because this is going to be uh, strangely offensive towards white people, I'm guessing, <laughs> which will be quite interesting. Or maybe they just treat them as, like, they're the greatest thing ever and we're letting them down. Either way, I'm imagining a lot of condescension. And usually the condescension in these old films are towards minorities. But Appalachian are kind of like white minorities. We see a log cabin while musically there's some, someone humming. Maybe several people humming like a... Kind of sounds like it's probably a church hymn. Um, Because aren't they very religious in the Appalachia Mountains? Okay, I'll admit, I know very, very little of Appalachia Mountains and their people. So, you know, I very well am going to bring my own prejudice of, you know, their mountain hillbillies. So that's as far as I know, and they're inbred, right? I don't know. That's unfair to say, but I think um, the film's going to take the same attitude. Apparently, they're uh, going to showcase real people with some experiments done by universities to see what schools can do to improve the local neighborhood. So this will be interesting. How does the university see the Appalachian kids? And is this experiment involving, like, testing their brains and dissecting? I hope so. I doubt it will, but that'd be kind of cool. I, w- I want to see them, like, dissect a hillbilly. There's a movie idea. Dissecting a hillbilly to create some sort of super hillbilly. Get on this, Hollywood. This film is making me very sad right away. Because musically, like, they're... It's, it's some sort of him. That kind of sounds like Danny Boy. But, you know, not Irish. But white trash. <laughs> That's unfair of me to say white trash. Which is probably going to get me banned. Because if you say white trash, you get banned off of Facebook. So, I don't know, we'll... Saying white trash get me banned off of all these podcast places I'm on. But the song is like, oh, Danny boy, but do something, George. I, I don't know, but it's very sad. It's very sad music. And the narrator is telling us about, like, a quick history of the Appalachian people and how while everyone else moved out west, these people stayed behind in the mountains and the land has slowly just become barren and all they can grow is corn um which i didn't realize corn also comes from the appalachians i thought it was just purely midwest like the plains and stuff but i guess corn grows in the mountains as well and unfortunately the mountains have like cut these people off from the ever-changing world so they can't learn what's going on the outside it's just mouth to mouth from father to son to grandson to great-grandson will they ever learn meanwhile the dad is chopping up firewood for the stove uh, heater because it's very cold in the mountains and he can't teach his kids no yeah i mean that's kind of how the song goes father checks on his children who are all sleeping in one bed there's i think three of them And they're so poor they can't afford, like, real wallpaper. They just have newspapers lining up the wall. And everything's very sad. And the song is something about checking on your children while they sleep. Like, seriously, like, the song's just kind of narrating what's going on. But then the mom comes in to check on them. And for some reason, the music gets suddenly, like, happier. Children, mother... Um, well, the happy song isn't quite as literal, but it's way too happy, and the mom's happy, and the child that she woke up is happy, because everyone's happy when mom's around. Okay, this song is kind of literal, because it's about asking the boy what he wants for breakfast. What do you want for breakfast, Billy boy? I don't want nothing, mother. Because we can't afford real food. Okay, not that part, but... I mean, 
Yeah, like the kid in the song doesn't want anything. So I'm assuming because they can't really afford food. Because it uh, looks like mom's going to cook some breakfast. She looks like she's making dough balls. Like, I, I don't know. It seemed like she had a big thing of dough. And she just cut some parts off it, rolled it into balls, and threw it on the stove. So dough balls. It's what's for breakfast. And the little kid's crying because the mom had to get him dressed. And he doesn't want to get dressed. The older kids, you know, they get dressed with no problem. And when the fuck are we going to start with the experiment? Is this the experiment? Like, we're just seeing what if... You know, I guess you got to have the control group. What if we do nothing? And then we see what if we do something? Just get on with the experiment. And stop this singing. It's making me sad. But give me the recipe for dough balls. Man, this is just so depressing. Like, so their breakfast is like cornbread and pork sausage from a pig that they killed early in the season. And the pig has to last like all winter long. And they've got pork gravy. And that, that's their breakfast. And lunch and dinner, I think. Because as the narrator tells us, like, they don't have green vegetables or milk. So they get, like, rickets and scurvy because they don't have enough vitamins and mineral. And I just feel sad for these Appalachians. Like, government has to come and save them or something. Why? Why is life so tough for them? And, yeah, I'm being a little dramatic, but this is actually kind of depressing. So get on with the fucking experiment! I'm sick of this. I don't want to cry. I don't want my podcast listeners to have to listen to me cry. Then the music gets a little upbeat again. Um, I don't get why it's, like, going upbeat, because it's not showing anything happy. Um, the kids are going to school, walking through the snow, uphill. I mean, yeah, I guess these are your grandparents complaining about the situation they had to go to school your grandparents were mountain people um but you know the kids are kind of happy and they learn to count to 17 why do you stop at 17 i'm not sure but that's what the narrator said they count to 17 like i don't know if he just pulled that random number as an example and it doesn't mean that's the only number they stop <laughs> count to but I don't know. Maybe that's the mountain problem. Pro the mountain people. That's their big problem, I guess, is they don't know how to count past 17. And they get to use the same fancy books that, you know, the rich towns use. But it doesn't do them very good, I guess, because it doesn't really tell the way of the life of the mountain people. And, you know, the mountain people, they know where the hornets are and what the different birds are but they don't know how to take care of their lack of food and lack of clothes. And the books they read are telling about how to start collecting stamps and how to choose which candy you're going to buy for a penny. Um, so that is just fucking cruel that, like, these poor mountain kids have to, like, read these books about things they will never get to experience. Like, just, it's all these fantasy books, like... All the glorious candy of the world. It tastes so delicious and so sweet. And you poor motherfuckers will never get to enjoy it. Enjoy your pork fat. Which, I mean, nothing against pork fat. Pork fat is tasty. But it's not candy. And these poor mountain kids will never know the joy of collecting stamps. I don't know what the joy of collecting stamps are. Like, how did that become a hobby, anyhow? Like, stamps. I, I use them to mail letters. I mean, I guess I could see nowadays stamp collecting becoming a thing again, because who the fuck sends real letters through the mail? So you don't really use stamps. So, yeah, collect those stamps. But back in the days, like, it just... Like, coin collecting. Like, is it that fascinating? I don't know. I... I will never understand the ways of the stamp collecting. So I have that in common with you, hillbilly mountain folk. But I guess things are going to get better on the education front. Because starting next year, there's going to be new books that were made specifically by the mountain folk. Um, and of course, like not real books. They're just kind of pieces of paper. 
stapled together. But it will teach the kids about goats and all the wonderful things you can get from goats. Because it makes sense, because there's goats in the mountains. So you need to learn about goats, not stamps. Which, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, we should have, like, localized education to teach kids about their own environment. Doesn't really work anymore with, like, the global world we live in. But back then in the 40s, you know, they need to know how to use the land around them. And children must learn, because it's too late for the old folk. And this, this was pretty depressing, actually. Um, I don't know how much of it was just that fucking music. That was just like, this is a depressing humming we're doing. Just... I, I don't know. Is there a charity I can donate? Can I adopt one of these Appalachian kids? Because um, just I feel so bad for them. It's so sad. They don't have candy or stamps. Okay, this next one is called Daft Inventions, which is about daft people doing daft things. And description tells me that it's quite funny, which is good, because... I don't want to have to slip my wrist over the Appalachian kids. That thing was fucking depressing, so I could use a good laugh. It's mostly people trying to fly with crazy ideas to get them off the ground. Oh boy. I hope people fall, because I love watching people fall. Um, the women's skateboarding competition at the Olympics was great, because they all kept falling. Which, you know, nothing against them as people. I just like watching people fall. Um, I want Jackass to become an official Olympic sport. So, let's watch some daft inventions. Yeah, so this is basically is kind of like a early 20th century Jackass. Uh, first we've got a guy who's got these homemade giant wooden wings with a giant, like, tail. But not like a bird tail, like a plane tail. And he jumps off a rock. <laughs> it's kind of weird, because it's not even like a very large height. Like, I guess he decided, smartly, let me try from a small height before I kill myself. So he jumps off the rock and crashes. Fantastic. And then this other person has, like, their kind of, like, own little homemade plane that runs on, like, bicycle power or something. And so he's going, going, going. Another crash. Which, again, at least he was smart enough not to try it from a giant height. So fantastic. This is so much better than the Appalachian kids. And then we've got a woman on a zip line by her teeth. And she's on the top of like really tall building. And she makes it. Which, on the one hand, I'm glad she's not dead. On the other hand, I was hoping that at least when she got to the end, then she'd like fall or something. You know, it's not funny when they don't fall. It's not funny when someone succeeds at doing a dangerous stunt. I'm curious as to when this film was made. Because even though all the footage is, like, clearly from, like, the 20s and probably the 1910s. Um, whoa, weird. You know, I say the 20s, and clearly I mean the 1920s. But technically, we are in the 20s. We are in the 2020s. That's kind of weird. That, that just kind of, like, is weird to think about. So, th but this footage is from the 1920s, but the music is, like, obviously, like, it's funky. It's, like, funk music. This did not exist back in the 20s. We've got some good, like, bass, uh, bum, 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 and that, like, funky-ass guitar. Um, it's kind of, uh, porn funk. It's kind of the funk that you got in porn movies in the 70s, which I guess this is sort of, uh, porn of watching people doing stupid stuff. Um, they tell us about human flies, which I've never understood why they're called human flies. Those people that climb up the walls of buildings. Because flies don't really climb up the walls. They kind of just fly, land somewhere really annoying. So, I mean, I guess the part of, since they're annoying, they're kind of like flies, but shouldn't they be like human like cockroaches or something or 
human insects. Just just a like broad human bug or something. Why a, sp- a fly specifically? Like, because if you were to swat at one of these people climbing up the side of the building, they're not going to fly. They'll try to fly and then go splat. Um, then we get get someone on stilts on one of like those construction girders, which is just so like super dangerous. Um, I think he probably went splat, but we don't got the footage of that. There's one of those guys who's like on a chair, on top of a chair, on top of a building, which, how do you even think that one up? Like, I'm going to sit on a chair. No, I'm going to sit on a chair on top of a chair at the top of the building to show how badass I am. And yeah, you're badass until you go splat. I mean, we haven't seen anyone gone splat, which is good because then that would just turn this into like, you know, the early 20th century version of Faces of Death. Seriously, whoever's idea it was to combine, like, early 1920s footage of people being stupid with funk music is a genius. Um, true, it's just very, very generic funk music, but it still, like, works fantastically. So we get a lot of more, like, idiotic stunts, and then we see a fucking Roomba. Like an early, like, 20th century Roomba. What the fuck? They actually had these things? Granted, I don't know if its purpose was to vacuum, but it kind of just... It looked like a space-age Roomba. It just kind of, like, went running around the floor like a fucking battle bot or something, but very, like, sleek, um, just kind of, like, sports car design. It's fantastic. Some of these vehicles they show are actually, like, pretty fucking cool, though. Like, there's these, like, sort of, like, passenger trains that can, like, just drive over each other. Which, technology has come a long way in, like, a hundred years. Why are we not still using these? And just made, like, a super safe version. But it's still cool. I would fucking ride on a train that would drive over another train. That would be cool. Just... Um, Amway, or whatever company does trains, work on this. The technology has to be there, because it already exists, so you can improve on this. Because I can see, like, okay, maybe back then it was dangerous. But nowadays, it's gotta work. It's gotta work. And then we see a guy run headfirst into a wall. No reason. He just does. And I love it. You know what? I now... I want to see the old Three Stooges shorts redone, but with funk music. Because, oh my god, it makes this all so much better. Then there's a guy who's invented a robot that can play golf. We don't get too much of it, but... I would like to see that. I want a robot, robot golf league. I would watch golf if robots were playing. That's just fucking awesome. Come on, really. And so, it ends with, like, a, another montage of people trying to fly their homemade planes, which, I'm imagining they're all, like, rich people, and it's, like, their version of Jeff Bezos flying to space in a giant dick. But, um, I'll give credit to these people that at least they're not stupid enough to try to start with flying from a large altitude from a large height they're just kind of it's like if you jumped up and then crashed to the ground you're gonna get hurt not badly hurt but hurt enough that we can laugh at you and i really needed that after that fucking appalachian kid video um so i am once again back in a good mood up next is doomsday for past which, at first, I thought it said Doomsday for Pets, which was sounded like it was going to be a very scary video of, like, what's going to happen to our pets are going to all die at once or something. But no, it's for pests, like bugs. And um, this is from Sherwin-Williams, and it's about DDT. Um, not Jake the Snake's Robert's finishing move, but the pesticide. Um, about their product, Pestro. Um... 
So, is that a... I'm guessing that's not something they make anymore. I've never heard of pest Pestroy. Oh, get, I get it. Because it's pest and destroy. Pestroy. Um, yeah, but I don't think they make this anymore. Because, um, you know, basically pesticides aren't really made anymore. Yeah, I don't think they make DDT anymore. Um, but it's got cartoon characters for this film. So, oh boy. Doomsday for pests. So I'm curious on who made it because it doesn't say, but um, it's coming off like one of those old like Looney Tunes, Merry Mel- Melodies cartoon uh, with like the music of stock public domain music playing like Flight of the Bumblebee while this bug that's not a bumblebee is flying around the candle. And he sits by the candle and he's reading the newspaper, which is just full of bad news about Pestroy. Pest... Pestroy? Pe- it's one of those words that just sounds weird when you say it. Pestroy. But, you know, it's the end of the world, basically, because it's just an epidemic killing bugs left and right. It's worse than the atom bomb, which I don't know if you want to associate your product with being more powerful than an atomic bomb, Sherwin-Williams that I never realized did anything other than paint. But, because you might think, like, oh, you know, I was going to use this pesticide, but it's stronger than the A-bomb. That, um, might kill me. Yeah. I want the bugs dead, but not me dead. So I'm going to pass on Pestroy. But maybe it's just relative to the bugs. Which, actually, like, won't bug certain bugs survive a nuclear fallout anyhow. So, if it's more powerful than an atomic bomb that could kill bugs, dear God, I don't want to use this. It's going to fucking fry me in, like, seconds. I don't want to be dead like the bugs. But this uh, moth thingamajig, I am not really sure what bug he is. He drops the paper because he's so scared and flies away. And... The cockroach comes by, and he decides he's going to read the paper. But he needs to get his glasses out, because he's nearsighted. I guess he's an old cockroach. And he, unfortunately, has opened it up to the obituary page. And there's just page after page after page. Probably like ten pages full of bugs that have been killed by Pestroy. And... Shit. Pestroy. Pestroy? Or Pestroy? Ugh, this is really bugging me now. No pun intended. Or was it? We see a silverfish sitting by the radio, and she's very sad as uh, the radio broadcaster is giving off the names of silverfish who have died recently due to Pestroy. And the fleas are just hanging out because they're kind of like old rich guys, old rich white guys, and they're like study, smoking cigars, and just nonchalantly talking about how Pestroy's killing everyone, and apparently one of their friends has committed suicide as opposed to having to deal with Pestroy, yet his way of committing suicide was to jump on a dog that was coated with Pestroy flea treatment. Safe for pets, I guess. Um, So that seems kind of uh, productive. You want to kill yourself to avoid being killed by Pestroy. But the way you kill yourself is by subjecting yourself to Pestroy. And, although, I mean, I guess, you know, you are just don't have to be wrecked with the dread of waiting for Pestroy to come. You go to Pestroy. But in the newspaper, they say there's going to be a film playing about the facts of Pestroy. Which seems like a very big deal. Uh, I guess it will be an educational film for the bugs. So it's kind of... I, I don't know if it's quite irony, but... We're watching an educational film about bugs watching an educational film. All these bugs uh, line up into the theater. So many that I'm thinking this film might be a trap. You know, it's kind of like a roach motel. The roaches go in, but they don't check out... <laughs> You know, I completely screwed it up. They check in, but they don't check out. So, you know, this is like a 
bug movie theater. The bugs come in, but they don't come out. And if I took a few minutes, I could probably come up with something clever, a pun on, like, movies, but that's eh, not worth it. So, but the movie they're watching is in live action, so that's pretty cool. And it's showing, like, humans using pesticide, which, it's like military-grade jets dumping the pesticides, and a guy with, like, looking like General Patton or something with the old-school army helmet, you know, the big green plastic thing that, like, the plastic army guys wear. And he's spraying it all over the water, which scares me. Is no wonder they stopped using pesticide. You gotta use the fucking military to get that out? Oh, man, that that's frightening. But luckily, there's a... Well, luckily for us, not luckily for the bugs. Remember, this is all bad news from the bugs' point of view. The scientists have created a new formula, Pestroy, which closes the loopholes that have allowed bugs to survive. Let's find out what these loopholes are and how they got closed. Okay, so I guess they're not going to tell us what the loopholes are. But apparently, once a bug walks on some of this DDT of the Pestroy, it goes straight through their legs and into their nervous system and all that. And within a matter of minutes, it kills them. And we get to see a fly die from this pesticide right before our eyes, which... I mean, for us, it's like, eh, that's kind of cool. Fly died. But that's got to be fucking dramatic for the bugs that are watching this film. Like, they didn't even get a warning. Like, warning, graphic footage. Like, I don't know. Bugs were just kind of tougher in those days. They weren't as queasy, you know. It isn't a generation of snowflake bugs. And apparently Pestroy has a concentration of DDT... That's higher than government-regulated DDT pesticides, which, holy fuck, no wonder they don't make Pestroy anymore. It's fucking stronger than what the government makes? Dear Lord, that really is not just killing bugs. It's fucking killing you. It's killing your lungs. Um, but it's not a spray like old DDT. It's more like a paint that you just kind of brush on the surfaces, which... And you probably touch it because people are stupid and always touch wet paint and then lick their hands. So it's going to fucking kill you because it is like, I mean, the can says 6% DDT. So that sounds like it's not very high. But remember, it's higher than government issue pesticide. Like even the government doesn't go this strong with DDT. And then they show an experiment where there's two cages, one that got treated with the pestroy and one that didn't. And they have all these flies. And over the course of 25 minutes, all the flies within the pestro cage die. Which again, holy fuck, why didn't they warn the viewers? To us at home, yeah, we don't care because they're just flies. But there's flies in the theater watching this. You're just watching... My God, they're watching genocide. That is what they're seeing. And the least that could have been done, they could have given a heads up of very violent images coming up. Man, I, I'm glad I am not a fly in that theater, which I'm sure is a trap and they're all going to die. And one of the bugs in the theater says, man, there's got to be some sort of catch. It's got to be harmful to humans, too. And the movie says, it's not harmful. Because, you know, in the old Looney Tunes type cartoons, you know, you talk to the movie screen and the movie screen talks back to you. But, you know, they claim, the film claims that, nope, it's not harmful to humans or pets, which I call bullshit on, because, you know, DDT is banned for a reason, because it is harmful to all sorts of shit. And again... It's stronger than government issue DDT. Just, I mean, isn't DDT like what the military used to destroy other countries anyhow? So think about that. The government was using DDT 
to destroy other countries. And Sherwin Williams came out with a DDT that's even fucking stronger. And we're supposed to believe that yeah, it's okay for humans and for pets. Just, uh, no, I don't trust you, Sherwin Williams. Now I'm not even going to use your fucking paint because it's probably got higher level of leads than the government uses. It's, they're just poison all around. I don't think they care. Sherwin Williams is trying to kill us all. And also traumatize bugs because the film then shows all the different ways you can apply Pestroy and then all the different insects that it kills and just insect murder porn, basically. Like, just all these different insects died. Just gotta be fucking traumatic! Although, at this point, maybe the bugs are just numb to it all. Like, we've seen so much death on screen. Well, the bugs leave the theater, so the theater wasn't a trap like I was expecting it to be. Um, good for them. But the bugs are like, ah, I don't believe this is really a danger. Then suddenly the air raid sirens, there's a pestroy attack. And you see a human hand spraying pestroy all over the place. Which is kind of odd, because the whole, like, film has been spent, like, extolling the virtues of pestroy in that... It's not a aerosol spray that you just brush it right on so it's more effective. And then they end with killing the bugs with an aerosol spray. But, yeah. I guess if I was back then and didn't know better, then yeah, I might think, oh, well, let's try some Pestroy and kill these fucking bugs. But now that I know that it's fucking stronger than what the government uses. It will fucking kill us. Sherwin Williams wants us to die. Allegedly. I'm going to say allegedly. Because even though no one listens to this podcast, if someone from Sherwin Williams happens to listen to this and goes, well, that's fucking slander and sues me and, you know, takes the 25 cents I've earned from this podcast... They'll take all 25 of those cents. Nope, they won't take 24 and leave me with a penny. They will take all fucking 25 cents. I'm gonna end this round of educational films with Facing Reality. A surreal presentation of the common ways in which people escape from reality. Daydreaming, identification, suppression, and malingering, malingering... Yeah, whatever that is. So, um... Since it's called Facing Reality, they probably want me to face reality and stop doing these things. So I'm gonna learn how to stop doing those things and get back to reality. Which probably, one of those steps is to stop doing this podcast. So, no! I will not face reality if I need to end this podcast. Because this podcast is for the person. Not for the people. Because for the people implies there's more than one person listening. Whoever you are that's listening, I love you. So let's face reality together. Oh my god, I'm fucking frightened already. Like, there's a group of kids in a circle, and this woman walking around, and she's got a plastic mask on her face, and then one on the back of her head. And they tell us that, you know, she claims that... She doesn't want things, but only after she finds out she can't have them. And she is two-faced. Which I'm pretty sure is not what that fucking term is. I I, I don't think being two-faced means... Isn't that more sour grapes than two-faced? Maybe maybe the kids back then just had different lingo. Um, But it's fucking scary as hell, these... I can understand the one on the back of her head because, you know, obviously she doesn't have a real face on the back of her head. And I don't, I guess maybe they thought she needed one on her regular face because otherwise it would look weird. But they had to choose the scariest looking plastic masks. I am frightened. I am having nightmares tonight. I, if that's reality, I don't want to face it. 
And then we've got a football player that isn't doing very good at football, and the coach has benched him or something, and so he blames everyone else because he's doing projection. He's projecting the fault on everyone else. Um, I'm also not entirely sure that's projection. Um, I guess it's a form of projection, but I thought it was just kind of when you're projecting your own insecurities onto other people. Maybe, I don't know. I go to therapy and I still don't fucking understand all sorts of psychobabble. Then there's the girl who's just negative all the time. She, they didn't even really give a reason that she is negative. She just is. She just shakes her head no at everything. Ooh, she's a negative Nancy. And then there's the boy who can't dance. Which, a problem so many of us face. So he goes to dances and he brings a pint of alcohol in one of those flasks and drinks. And... I don't know. This movie thinks that's a bad thing. I say he's the cool kid. I don't care that he can't dance. He's getting a buzz, and maybe he'll let me have a sip. And, But unfortunately, in the morning, he'll have a hangover and still can't dance. Of course, by that point in the morning, he's probably more concerned with the hangover and not the lack of danceabil- dancing skills. He probably just doesn't give a shit anymore if he can't dance. You know... He probably doesn't give a shit in the first place, because he's getting fucking drunk. Which is the way it should be. If you can't dance, might as well get drunk. Then there's a girl who always dreams about how beautiful she is. But then when she wakes up, she's face to face with her face. Which is just kind of fucking mean, if you think about it. Narrator just said she's fucking ugly. (laughs) Like, she dreams she's beautiful, but back in reality... Yeah, she's not beautiful. You know what? You know what, girl? You are beautiful. Don't listen to that fucking narrator. If... Just live in your daydream all you want to think you're beautiful because you are beautiful. You know, it's like the secret. If you really believe on the inside that you're beautiful, you will be beautiful. Don't let this fucking narrator tell you you're ugly. And next up, we've got this guy who thinks he's a boxer. And I guess that's identification. Because he thinks he's the boxer. He's the welterweight. And that he's going to kick ass and he can take an ass kicking because he is the boxer. And then there's the kid who every time... Oh yeah, I skipped someone. Um, There's the girl who thinks that if she pretends something's not there, it'll just go away. That's suppression. Which, I mean... Isn't that true? If you just ignore things, it'll go away. Like all these weird like lumps on my body and rashes and all that. I just pretend they're not there and... They went away! I tell myself. The weirdest thing about it is... She's looking in the mirror and then looks away. Looks in the mirror, then looks away. So is it like something on her face? She's pretending it's gonna go away? Um, and then this guy, every time that works to be done, he's feels injury or hurt or sick. And that's called malingering, which, um, I've always known it as Munchausen disease. Although, although I guess Munchausen probably is when you physically really do think you're like ill, like it's not like an act where malingering is probably more like hypochondriasm, where you just think you're sick. Or maybe he's just faking it. In which case, he's a fucking asshole. You get out there and take out that wood, like you were told to from the narrator. So they tell us that it's important that even though we try these mechanisms, you know, sooner or later, we're faced back with reality. And then suddenly we're in a class where there's a teacher... Not the narrator, because the narrator was a woman. This is a man teacher, and he's basically saying the same thing to his students. And then class is early, and he promised that they would be able to talk about the dance. Because there's a dance coming up, and the head of the dance committee, he's gotten Jimmy and the boys. I think that was the name that he said. Something and the boys. 
and everyone's excited that they got this band. But if the dance goes beyond midnight, they have to pay them extra. Oh, boy. So, you know, get all your dances in while you can and then get out because we cannot stay. Fucking last call is going to be at, like, quarter to midnight. You can't do it at midnight because then technically you go past midnight. And I've seen it happen. I have seen at some bars that there is a cutoff time at midnight. Midnight comes on. Your band's still playing. You get the axe. You're cut. Which is very strange because most shows I've been to at bars generally don't start till midnight because no one shows up till midnight. Um... Because over here in Buffalo, bars are open till 4, so everyone just gets drunk late. So, but this dance has to be over by midnight, or you gotta pay extra for Jimmy and the boys. So they're trying to decide, you know, who's gonna be on the decorations committee, and they name a bunch of girls, and they're all excited, and then Mike, they ask him to be on the decoration committee, but he doesn't want to, because he's busy working on the Great American Novel. I accept that excuse. It's the fucking great American novel. And he's a white guy, and every great American novel, as we've been taught in school, is from a white guy, right? Yeah, that's how it works. So, but we need more great American novels. So, Mike, you get to work on it. But no, everyone makes fun of him because he wants to write a book. You know what? Fuck them, Mike. You're a genius. You follow your heart. And then they're deciding, okay, is it going to be a formal or a costume party? And, you know, everyone wants formal, except for Mike, because he's a rebel. He goes his own way. He's not part of the fucking sheeple. He follows his heart, and he wants it to be a costume party. Because, and quote, plaid shirts and jeans are more colorful. And I am lost. That's a costume party? Jeans and plaid shirts? Like... Don't you wear, like, actual costumes? Wouldn't this be more an informal party if you get to wear jeans? And just... Wow. Mike, I've lost respect for you for not knowing what costumes are. So they have the vote, and everyone wants it formal, except for Mike. And it pisses everyone else off, because apparently it's got to be unanimous? When the fuck does that work with votes? In school. You're just... You're giving a little too much leeway here, head of the committee. Like, oh, it's, everyone's gotta be on board. You go, no, fuck you, Mike. You want this party? It's formal or nothing. You can stay home and drink and work on your great American novel. We're having a formal party. And the narrator says, it's all about his inadequacies. You know... Mike is just worried that he can't do good decorations, so he doesn't want to be on there. And he's going to be a contrarian and say no so that everyone can try to convince him. So he can be the, quote, center of attraction. Which again, he's... Has lingo changed that much? Um, well, I guess it's, what, like 80 years now since the 50s? That is crazy. But yeah, shouldn't it be that he's the center of attention, not attraction? But finally, he gives in. All right, and it's going to be a formal. At home, Mike's telling his parents like, "Oh, I don't even I don't know if I even want to go to dance. It's going to be lame and, you know, everyone's going to be dressed up in lame clothes and the music's going to be lame and I like you again, Mike. Cuz you know what? Fuck those lame ass lamos. You know, you don't have to go to this dance. You stay home and write the great American novel and be cool. Don't be lame. Of course, his 10-year-old sister says, Oh, it's probably because no girls want to dance with you. And you shut your whore mouth, 10-year-old girl. Maybe Mike doesn't want to dance with girls. Maybe he wants to dance with boys, and those kind of boys aren't going to be dancing at the dance. Because you know what? fucking 1950s repressed homosexuality. You know what? Fuck that, Mike. If you want to dance with boys, you go down to the hidden gay bar on the other side of town, and you fucking dance. No, you're not even dancing with boys. You're dancing with men. 
yeah, that's okay if that's what you want. And if it's just that, you know, girls don't want to dance with you, that's okay too. Because you know what? That's how you write the great American novel. Everyone who's written a great American novel couldn't get laid. John Steinbeck, Stephen King, John Malkovich. I don't know if he wrote a book, but none of them could get laid in high school. So, you know what, Mike? You follow your heart, and your heart is telling you, don't go to this dance. And apparently Mike has been suppressing some shit, like the time at the malt shop when he knocked over a glass and all the other kids laughed at him, or the time they were playing baseball and he didn't catch the ball and everyone laughed at him. And you fucking people want him to go to the dance with these assholes that laugh at him? Jeez, keep forcing them. He's going to fucking show up there with a gun and blast all of them away. Be like, oh, who's spilling cups now? Bang, bang, bang. Which, um, you got to picture it that he shoots someone and they've had a cup of punch in their hand and they drop it. And then he says, who's dropping cups now? Bang, bang. And I mean, he wouldn't say bang, bang. That's the sound the gun makes. But yeah, this kid's gonna fucking shoot up the school because everyone else is making fun of him. And it's all about, well, you know, Mike's got the problem. Not the kids that are teasing him and bullying him. No, it's Mike's fault for suppressing shit because sometimes it's okay to suppress shit. Don't wallow it in it. And if you're gonna wallow it in, in it, then write that fucking great American novel. Mike, do not go to this dance. Listen to me. Back at school, the teacher's telling the kids that, you know, sometimes it's good to find a friend or family member that you can talk to, and that will just help relieve all the something or other cycle babble. And all the kids leave except for Mike, who's there upset, and the teacher tells them, and quote, you know, sometimes the best place to get things on your mind is off. Okay, maybe not exact quote, but something stupid like that. And he's like, that's not good English, but it makes sense. And you know what? I'm going to disagree with you there. No, it doesn't fucking make sense. I mean, I get what you're saying, but no, it's... No, your sentence is horrible. It's so horrible, it can't make sense. And what you're trying to make sense of doesn't make sense anyhow. But Mike says, yeah, you're probably right. And the end. And I am getting fucking sick of these educational films ending on a cliffhanger. What happened? Does he go to the dance? Does he realize, you know, I got a man up and go to the stupid dance? Does he go, well, I got me a gun now, and ho, 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 I got a machine gun, I'm blowing all you fuckers away. Does he write the great American novel? What do we know about Mike? What happens to him? I need to know... But, so, that's it for this week. I hope you guys learned something. I learned nothing. But that's okay. You know, sometimes it's just about fun. Just about having fun and not about learning stuff. So, shoot me an email, velvetowl at hotmail.com, or leave a comment on the YouTube page if you're watching it through the YouTube page, or... I don't think there's comments on any of the other places that this is up on, but if there is, go ahead and leave a comment. And we'll do some more educational films next week, because I am all about educating you. And I just really don't feel like watching like a whole like hour and a half bad film. I will return to those one day, but I gotta get through these educational films, because they are amusing me. And... That's what this podcast is all about, amusing me, and hopefully you yourself get amused in the process.